Good afternoon. Thank you very much. Uh, the title of my talk is The Antisemitism of the Ayatollahs. Uh, that means I'm not going to talk about the Iranian population, but only about the Iranian regime, the government in Iran. I want to try uh, to make three points. First, I want to elaborate on what do I mean if I talk about the Iranian regime's antisemitism. Second, I will try to answer the question of whether there have been any substantial changes under the new Iranian president, Hassan Rouhani. And at the end, I will discuss the question what role the regime's anti-Semitic ideology plays for the formulation of its foreign policy. And to answer the last two questions, I have to say at least something about the specifics of the regime beside its anti-Semitic character. So first, the regime's anti-Semitism is expressed in traditional Jew hatred, a worldview based on conspiracy theories and projection, Holocaust denial, and hatred of the Jewish state. For the Iranian dictatorship, the Middle Eastern conflict is, of course, not about improving the lot of the Palestinians, a two-state solution, or any kind of compromise or agreement, but explicitly about destroying Israel. The destruction of Israel has been the official policy of the Islamic Republic since 1979. It is advocated not only by the fanatical supporters of ex-president Mahmoud Ahmadinejad, but also by conservatives and those ayatollahs that the West treats as pragmatists, moder moderates, or reformists. In Iran, the slogan, Mark by Israel, death to Israel, has since 1979 been a staple of Islamist state propaganda. In 2012, to give you just one example, the supreme leader, Ali Khamenei, described Israel as, I quote, a cancerous tumor that should be cut and will be cut, end quote. So to keep it short, my colleague, Waid Wadatak, has aptly described the program of the Iranian regime as eliminatory anti-Zionism. But the founder of the Islamic Republic, Ayatollah Khomeini, was not only hostile to the Jewish state, but openly proclaimed his enmity towards the Jews. In a classic case of projection of his own megalomania, Khomeini believed himself engaged in a struggle against an unfolding plan for Jewish world domination about, about which he had already fantasized in his central text, Islamic government. And I quote, we must protect and make the people aware that the Jews and their foreign backers are opposed to the very foundations of Islam and wish to establish Jewish domination throughout the world." End quote. A major role in the spread of anti-Semitism in Iran has been played by the Persian translation of the anti-Semitic screed, the Protocols of the Elders of Sion. First published in 78, large print runs of several new editions have since been issued by official Iranian bodies sometimes with modified titles such as the protocols of the Jewish leaders for the domination of the world. This modified title is in itself enough to show that the sporadic efforts by the Iranian leadership to draw a sharper distinction between Jews and Zionists have had little effect. Moreover, when Iranian propaganda talks about Zionists, it al almost always associates the term with the conspiracy theories characteristic of traditional anti-Semitism against Jews. In the Iranian regime's ideology and propaganda, Zionism is attacked not as an everyday political opponent, but as a root cause of virtually all the world's problems whose destruction would pave the way to salvation. One tool in gaining this kind of salvation is Holocaust denial. And that's not only true for the so-called hardliners, Ali Akbar Hashemi Rafsanjani's statement that only a single nuclear bomb would be needed to destroy Israel, while the Islamic world would only be harmed by the anticipated counter-strikes, is notorious. Less well known is his Holocaust denial. According to the Anti-Defamation League, Rafsanjani, who was always considered to be a moderate by the West, Rafsanjani stated on Iranian radio that his personal researches had led him to the conclusion that Hitler had murdered only 20,000 Jews. His successor, Mohammed Katami, who is to this day regarded as a shining example of a so-called reformist Islamist, and who, by the way, is a strong supporter of the death penalty for homosexuals, Katami maintained the tradition when he positioned himself as one of the most passionate defenders of the French Holocaust denier Roger Garaudy, who he invited to Tehran. 
if we try to explain the Iranian regime's anti-Semitism, I think we should reject explanations of Islamic anti-Semitism based on the exegesis of religious texts that find the roots of the Jew hatred of the 20th and 21st centuries in Quranic verses only. And we also should reject the so-called import thesis, according to which anti-Semitism was simply injected into the Islamic world from Europe at the start of the 20th century. Instead, I think we need an analysis of the modern regressive tendencies in Islamic society itself. Virtually all the topoi of modern anti-Semitism, as described by, by Adorno and Horkheimer in Elements of Anti-Semitism, can be demonstrated in the Iranian Islamist ideology. In particular, the glorification of a concretely transfigured, organic, authentic, destiny-fulfilling and harmonious community, seen as the opposite of a chaotic, abstract, alienated, rotten, artificial, immoral, materialist, conflict-ridden, and in the last analysis, Jew-associated social model. It's very important to take a look on the resentful anti-capitalism of Islamist ideology. While the Nazis drew a distinction between rapacious and productive capital, raffendes und schaffendes Kapital, and identified the former with the Jews and the latter with the Aryan folk communities of Volksgemeinschaft, the Ayatollahs proclaim as the alternative to parasitic capitalism, the so-called Islamic economy. In an inspiring study published last year, my colleague Ulrike Marz characterizes the so-called Islamic economy as an ethically and morally overlaid variant of capitalism that no more breaks with exploitation and surplus value than do other ideologies that attempt to manage capitalism. Marz points out, I quote, the belief in the possibility of excluding exploitation from the capitalist economy and laying the blame for it on an enemy of Islam leads the Iranian religious leaders to a critique of capitalism that is not only religious, but also anti-Semitic." The anti-Semitic ideology of the Iranian regime is not mere rhetoric from, early, from the early times of the revolution, but one of the main reasons for the Ayatollahs to spend billions on fighting Israel and it repeatedly produces overtly anti-Semitic actions, such as the bombing of the Amir building, the Jewish community center in Buenos Aires in 1994. Of course, that's a long time ago, but this event is very important to answer my next question, whether there have been any substantial changes under the new Iranian president, Rouhani. 85 people were killed and hundreds seriously wounded in the Amir attack, making it one of the bloodiest anti-Semitic incidents since the end of World War II. The decision to commit this massacre was approved by a special committee closely linked to the Iranian regime's Supreme National Security Council. Hassan Rouhani was at that time the secretary of the council, and according to uh, Argentinian special prosecutor Alberto Nisman, he was also part of the special committee. Rouhani stands, in my opinion, for a change of tactics, not of strategy. The goals remain the same, but the rhetoric has changed from that employed during Ahmadinejad's presidency. In 2014 and 15, like his predecessors, Rouhani took part in Tehran in Al-Quds Day, on which demonstrations calling for the destruction of the Jewish state have been held throughout the world at the end of Ramadan since 79. For Rouhani, Israel is an old wound that has been sitting on the body of the Islamic world and, a quote from 2014, a festering tumor. And again, we have to take a look on the strongman in Iran, which still is not the president, but, but the supreme leader. A few days before the Geneva talks opened in 2013, Ali Khamenei called again for the so-called liberation of Palestine. And even when the talks were underway, he assailed Israel as a bastard regime. On the anniversary of so-called Kristallnacht 2014, Khamenei published a detailed Q&A headed, why should and how can Israel be eliminated? None of which was even mentioned, let alone criticized by any of the governments participating in the neg negotiations with the regime. Days before the announcement of the nuclear deal in 2015, Rafsanjani again declared that Israel, quote, will be wiped off the map, end quote. Only two days after the deal, Khamenei published his 400 pages book, Palestine, 
in which he again called Israel a cancerous tumor and demanded its annihilation. And just some weeks ago, the regime tested, in clear violation of United uh, Nations Security Council resolutions, ballistic missiles, missiles carrying the message, Israel must be wiped out in Farsi and as a special service also in Hebrew. Even if it comes to Holocaust denial, we see continuity. On Kamenei's official English language webpage, one can to this day read about, I quote, the myths of the massacre of Jews known as the Holocaust. Rouhani wants to tone things down in this respect a little bit and has developed a kind of, if there is such thing, moderate Holocaust denial. When asked in an interview whether he believed the Shoah was a myth, Rani confined himself to insisting that he was a politician and not a historian, and so could not say anything about the dimension of historic events. Which is, of course, a, a known strategy of international Holocaust deniers if they speak in countries where it is simply not allowed to deny the Holocaust. Once the Rani government had learned that it could restore its position with little likelihood of criticism from the EU or also the United States, the momentary cautiousness regarding Holocaust denial vanished. In September 2014, the Ayatollahs once again gave a platform to a gathering of Holocaust deniers from all over the world at the so-called New Horizon Conference in Tehran. Among the participants were, just to give you again one example, Italian history professor Claudio Moffa, openly presented on the conference website like this, I quote, he achieved international fame through revisionist statements in particular by the public denial of the Holocaust, end quote. Senior government officials attended the conference. Said Jalili, secretary of the Supreme National Security Council took part as did the current president of the Iranian parliament's foreign affairs committee and Ali Asghar Sultaniyeh, the regime's long-standing representative at the International Atomic Ed Energy Agency in Vienna. The difference from the 2006 Holocaust denial conference during Ahmadinejad's presidency is striking. While the earlier event drew condemnation from almost the entire world and attracted a great deal of media attention, in the age of Rouhani, the Western governments remained simply silent. If we want to assess Rouhani's government, we have to understand the internal power struggle in Iran. Internally, the Islamic Republic is marked by the existence of a parallel state and so-called revolutionary institutions organized in the form of competing gang-like factions. However, the anti-Semitic worldview and the threats of the destruction against Israel play a decisive and indeed necessary role in integrating the hostile gangs. And the factional fight is not only over who is to, uh, who is to get the biggest share of the pie, but also over who can best advance in the program of eliminatory anti-Zionism. In the original and for a long time operational conception of the Islamic Republic, the supreme leader ruled over the factions and mediated between them. The Prince of the Believers, as one of the many titles held by the leader describes him, embodies the awareness that, as Khomeini once put it, the regime needs two wings in order to achieve its goals, and would be in danger of falling if one of them were simply to be cut off. This conception was called into question by Khamenei's clear and early support for Ahmadinejad during the 2009 electoral farce. Since Rouhani's election in 2013, it has once again become operational. One expression of this restoration has been the composition of Rouhani's government. In choosing his ministers, Rouhani took into account the wishes of almost all the factions to create a kind of grand coalition in order to broaden the base of the regime. Admittedly, supporters of Ahmadinejad and his long-standing spiritual mentor and political promoter, Ayatollah Mesbayasti, who favor a much more aggressive rhetoric, are not represented in Rouhani's cabinet. However, the fact that Khamenei has appointed Ahmadinejad a member of the influential Expediency Council <coughs> shows that even this faction will continue to play a role. I think it's uh, very clear that all factions of the regime support the threats against Israel and share the anti-Semitic worldview. But, and I come to my third and last point, Time and again, the question arises as to what role the anti-Semitic ideology play in the Iranian regime's political decision-making. 
The Islamic Republic's foreign policy has from the outset been characterized by equal measures of pragmatism and destructive irrationality. And this has enabled Western observers to continually downplay the significance of the latter, the destructive fantasies towards Israel, by reference to the former. To understand the concurrence of pragmatism and irrationality, we have to understand the basic concept of the Islamic Republic. What distinguishes the Iranian regime from other despotisms conditioned by Islam and makes it especially dangerous is a combination of a revolutionary activist Islamism, which is quite different from, for example, the Wahhabism, uh, which is characteristic for Saudi Arabia, centered on belief in the Mahdi, the state-driven effort to obtain the technology for weapons of mass destruction, and a radical anti-Zionism. The Mahdi is a hidden 12th Shiite Imam who, it is believed, will one day return. Under the Iranian constitution, it is he, the Mahdi, rather than the supreme leader, who is the head of state. Vilayat e the guardianship of the Islamic jurists, is intended through puritanical terror within and the export of the Islamic revolution abroad to pave the way for his return. On the one hand, the commitment to a so-called revolutionary foreign policy is inscribed in the Islamic Republic's constitution. The constitution is meant to apply beyond the borders of Iran. The regime openly proclaims its religious ideological goal of world rule. If it is to remain true to the letter of its own constitution, the regime is obliged consistently to pursue an activist foreign policy based exclusively on the dictates of revolutionary political Islam. On the other hand, in order to achieve the best possible balance between ideology and pragmatism, the requirement to obey even the supreme leader has been explicitly lifted precisely as regards, uh, regards discussions about foreign policy issues. The results can be seen in the publications of Iranian think tanks, such as the Institute for Middle East Strate Strategic Studies, in which, of course, always within the framework of the Islamic Republic's ideology, sharply contrasting positions on international political questions are sometimes expressed, but never about Israel. Representatives of the realist school of international relations, who refer always to the concept of a realpolitik, conclude that it should be possible to pragmatically integrate the Iranian regime into an international or at least regional security architecture. Such conclusions overlook the fact that the Ayatollahs have seized every opportunity to expand the sphere of influence and, more important for our context, they also ignore the fact <clears throat> that, as regards the threats to Israel, pragmatism can have no meaning for Tehran other than waiting for the right moment to go on the offensive. When it comes to Israel, pragmatism only means that the Islamic Republic is currently not looking for an all-out war with the Jewish state, but prefers to support its proxies like Hezbollah in Lebanon and Islamic Jihad in Gaza and the West Bank with weapons and billions of dollars and to expand their power in several Arab countries to reach a much better position for their fight against Israel. To understand the character of the Iranian regime is so important because that's not only of academic interests. In an interview with Jeffrey Goldberg in 2015, President Barack Obama laid out in public his view of the role of anti-Semitism in the government in Tehran, and unfortunately he joined those downplaying the implications of the regime's anti-Semitism. He stated, and I quote Obama, the fact that you're anti-Semitic or racist, there seems to be no difference between the two for the president, the fact that you're anti-Semitic or racist doesn't preclude you from being interested in survival. The fact that the supreme leader is anti-Semitic doesn't mean that this overrides all of his other considerations." End quote. The good thing about the statement is that for the very first time, as far as I can see it, it is officially admitted by the White House that Khamenei is an anti-Semite. But beside that, I think the statement is a dangerous misunderstanding of the self-destructive potential of modern anti-Semitism and of the Iranian ideology of martyrdom. A misunderstanding that we should counter by an analysis of the concurrence of pragmatism and destructive irrationality of the Iranian regime. Obama continued, 
that anti-Semites, uh, anti I quote again, <coughs> make irrational decisions with respect to discrimination, with respect to trying to use anti-Semitic rhetoric as an organizing tool, end quote. If this is your understanding of anti-Semitism, it might be rational to cut deals with Khamenei. But, I come to my end, but modern anti-Semitism is much more than discrimination, and it is, of course, much more than an organizing tool. Anti-Semitism is an irrational worldview. It's a delusional response to the crisis of modern societies. And, as we know from the experience of the 20th century, it is not only murderous, but has also at least the potential to be suicidal, to be self-destructive. And that means you cannot counter anti-Semitism, anti be it in Europe or in the Middle East, with the policy of negotiations or containment or deterrence. Thank you very much.